Hello, everybody out there. In TV land? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Is YouTube uh, considered a TV land? I think so. Okay. Okay. So we're back again with another true crime case. And tonight we are going to be going over the Tylenol murders. Yes. Mary Kay had a scratchy throat. Adam J. had bronchitis. Mary R., fresh off childbirth, had full body aches. Mary M. had a raging headache. Stan J. and his wife, Teresa, had suffered the loss of a loved one. Paula just needed to settle her nerves after the red-eye flight. One by one, these seven Chicago area residents popped extra strength Tylenol capsules. It was September 29th, 1982. All were dead within 24 hours. Psych psychologists called the killer so strange that their normal guidelines just don't work. And now, more than 35 years after Tylenol capsules laced with potassium cyanide killed seven people in the Chicago area, the Tylenol murders still have people wondering who committed such a heinous act with no apparent motive. The murder started in September 1982 when the parents of Mary Kellerman old a painkiller when she woke up complaining of a cold. She died hours later. Postal work worker Adam Janus died in another Chicago sur suburb later that morning. Janus's brother and brother's wife complaining of headaches while mourning Adam died too. In a few days the death toll grew. The only link th being that each victim had taken extra strength Tylenol. Over the next week of Chicago, and Mary Reiner of Winfield had all died in similar incidents. Warnings were then issued via the media and patrols using loudspeakers, warning residents throughout the Chicago metropolitan area to discontinue the use of Tylenol products. On testing, each one of the capsules provi provided to be laced, proved to, to be laced with potassium cyanide at a level toxic enough to provide thousands of lethal fatal doses. Police were baffled. The pills came from different production plants and were sold in different drugstores around the Chicago area. Their conclusion was that someone was most likely tampering with the drugs at the store shelves. The deaths set off a nationwide panic as stores rushed to remove Tylenol from their shelves and worried consumers overwhelmed hospitals and poison control hotlines. Chicago police went through the streets with loudspeakers warning residents of the dangers of taking Tylenol. Johnson & Johnson, the drugs manufacturer, spent millions of dollars recalling the pills from the stores. The tampering inspired hundreds of copycat incidents across the United States. The Food and Drug Administration tallied more than 270 different incidents of product tampering in the month following the Tylenol deaths. Pills tainted with everything from rat poison to hydrochloric acid sickened people around the country. Some copycats expanded to food tampering. That Halloween, parents reported finding sharp pins concealed in candy corn and candy bars. Some communities banned trick-or-treating altogether. Police never arrested anyone for the original Tylenol murders, but tax consultant James Lewis wrote a letter to the Tylenol's manufacturers in October 1982, demanding one million to stop the killings. Handwritten in capitals, in capitals, the letter gushed over cyanide. The poison operates quickly and takes very little and had New York postage. The letter said, Gentlemen, as you can see, it is easy to place cyanide, both potassium and sodium, into capsules sitting on the store shelves. And since the cyanide is inside the gelatin, it is easy to get buyers to swallow the bitter pill. Another beauty is that cyanide operates quickly. It takes so very little, and there will be no time to take countermeasures. If you don't mind the publicity of these little capsules, then do nothing. So far, I have spent less than $50, and it takes me 10 minutes per bottle. If you want to stop the killing, then wire $1 million to bank account number 84495970 at Continental Illinois Bank, Chicago, Illinois. Don't attempt to involve 
case with this letter. A couple of phone calls by me will undo anything you can possibly do. Lewis had a strange past. He had been charged with 1978's Kansas City murder after police found the remains of one of his formal, former clients, Raymond West, in bags in his attic. Lewis had fled to Chicago with his wife, Leanne, on heat that he'd killed Raymond under the pseudonym Robert and Nancy Richardson. The pair locked horns with Frederick McCahey, the Miller's brewer, brewing hair, who owned Lakeside Travel, where Nancy kept the books. Robert drifted as a temp for the First National Bank of Chicago. Lakeside would implode in a blaze of 18 bounced employee checks. One of these to the tune of $511 was Leanne's. Viewing the pair blamed Mackay shoddy, Mackay's shoddy management, they were struck down at an August wage claim hearing where the presiding officer didn't so much decide with Mackay as he, as he ruled the claim couldn't be filed against non-existent money. They were also sued by the currency exchange where Leanne cashed the check but only paid a quarter of the eventual fine. On September 4th, 1982, they lit out for the East Coast, this time as William and Karen Wagner. They quickly reassumed the Richardson handle, hopping from one dilapidated New York motel to another. But police could never tie him to the Tylenol killings, and he denied committing them. Lewis was convicted of extortion for the letter and spent more than 12 years in federal prison. Richard Bezerzek, the Chicago police superintendent at that time, said it was unlikely Lewis would ever be prosecuted for the killings themselves. A second man, Roger Arnold, a DIY chemist and a dock hand at a Jules Food warehouse west of Chicago was identified, investigated, and cleared of the killings. He had a nervous breakdown due to the media attention when he blamed on Marty Sinclair, a bar owner whom he believed in instigated the investigation on him. In the summer of 1983, Arnold shot and killed John Stanisha, an unrelated man whom he mistook for Sinclair and who did not know Arnold. Arnold was convicted in January 1984 and served 15 years of a 30-year sentence for second-degree murder. He died in June 2008. Laurie Dan, who poisoned and shot an unknown number of people in a May 1988 rampage in and around Wanetaka, Illinois, was briefly considered as a suspect, but no direct connection was found. But when police reopened their investigation, the focus shifted back to Lewis. His Cambridge, Massachusetts office was searched, as well as a storage unit he had rented nearby. The FBI has been tight-lipped about the reason for the search, and hasn't named Lewis in conjunction with, in conjunction with the reopened investigation. Police still have some of the tainted Tylenol capsules from the original killings, and are hopeful some DNA can be recovered from the pills for testing. How did this happen? Theories abound. Maybe the killer or killers replaced the acetaminophen, Tylenol's active ingredient, with cyanide on site. Visiting each store, there were five, and purchased the pills so as not to blow the, pain, the plan on a shoplifting charge. The switch could have been made in the parking lot, empty some capsules, fill with poison, poison recap pepper doctored pills at the top of the bottle, return to the store shelf repeat elsewhere. Or maybe it was done at any point in Tylenol's distribution. The atrocity could have been far-reaching if in fact it wasn't a factory or a warehouse scheme, which Lewis insists that it was. Either way, it was the perfect crime. There wasn't a better time or place. Commercial surveillance technologies were only just rolling out. Local economies were still largely cash-based. Blazing paper trails didn't concern whoever did this. There were no pictures, no credit cards, no witnesses, and no evidence, as put in a Chicago Reader case profile. 
Chicago Sprawl, still in the serial killer shadow of John Wayne Gacy, was the ideal unsuspecting backdrop providing the in plain sight of anonymity, the indiscriminate killings that make indiscriminate killings untraceable. That's why it's chilling. It was done randomly. Johnson and Johnson reeling from what could have spun out of control into a full-blown hysterical shaming had no choice but to pull its entire stock of Tylenol, some 25 to 30 million bottles from stores. This sort of recall was unprecedented in American history. Most Chicago market pills were incinerated or flushed down toilets. The company lost $100 million, but was praised for damage control that favored public safety not corporate earnings. The killings did have a measurable positive impact, however, a revolution in product safety standards. In the wake of the Tylenol poisonings, pharmaceutical and food industries dramatically improved their packaging, instituting tamper-proof seals and indicators and increasing security controls during the manufacturing process. The result has been a dramatic reduction in the number of copycat incidents, although it may be of little solace to the families of those seven victims. But now, as the FBI brings modern technology to bear on a case long since cold, perhaps they again can uh, find something else that's tangible and at last bring some criminal charges. And I think this this is a, an interesting case because as a pharmacy technician myself, I, I think this it plays a huge part because I remember hearing about this case when I started pharmacy and also the the laws that were put in place afterwards and how the drug manufacturers were forced to make this crazy amount of change that everybody instituted across the board so this case spawned all these regulations that allowed for change in the system to avoid any further type of contamination from occurring and we also have to remember I don't think anybody could remember before these tamper resistant of our generation but before this pharmacies weren't commonplace where like you have like an Eckerd's or a CVS or anything like that they were actually apothecaries so these apothecaries used to make their own pills they had the powder of the acetaminophen and they would actually pack it into the capsule itself so the public trusted these pills without any doubt because they were inside of a pharmacy that previously maybe about 10 years before this the apothecary the actual pharmacist on site would create the pills from scratch as part of the safety things like I know when I get prescriptions it actually says what to look for on the pill like it says exactly. this number it says the color and all that and the shape exactly and that was actually instituted in the early 80s and 90s um, because there was such a boom in the in the marketplace so these pills actually did have um, a lot we see so many pill advertisements and all these these medications there's I think there's listed under the FDA close to 200,000 different types of pills and those are only the ones regulated by the FDA that doesn't include any type of natural supplements that are outside of the scope of the FDA yeah. anything that's natural um, supplements or anything they are not monitored by the FDA um, so these these medications beforehand you had maybe about 2,000 so you're talking about from 2,000 to 200,000 that, that it jumped in, in uh, production. So the regulations weren't there for such a boom. And this case really put the radar of the FDA and said, we really need to start cracking down on this. And also a lot of the reason that the manufacture, the, the medications are so expensive nowadays mm -hmm. is because of these requirements and regulations that were put in place during cases like this that occurred. So what do you think? Do you think that Lewis did it or do you think Lewis was trying to just take credit for it to get the money from it? It would have been a very experienced chemist to be able to do this at this point in time because 
chemistry is a very hard subject like I remember working on on pills themselves because I used to work as a compounding pharma uh, in a compounding pharmacy so we would create the actual capsules like you see in in a Tylenol bottle back in the day mm -hmm. and those gel capsules that he was speaking of it basically starts off as a powder and you just mold it into that and you crush it down enough where it becomes liquefied and that's what he was actually talking about earlier when we were talking that's actually what he was saying that S he was able to create the same so you think he did it or i think it was the the second person the one that was the actual chemist yeah not lewis himself because i don't believe i think lewis was trying to get get his notoriety uh, more notoriety than anything and kind of just take advantage of it at least this is just personal opinion i do think that it would have been a trained uh, chemist to be able to do something like this and pull it off. Do you think it could be done today or do you think this is very much of the past that this it is can, the perfect crime? It can very easily be done today and untraceable mm -hmm. as well. So it is the perfect crime? Because, and they did it recently actually, there's cases that occurred recently oh, I didn't know that. that um, Tylenol again actually had to recall their brand because if you noticed recently about a year and a half ago, two years ago mm -hmm. there was a recall and you couldn't find Tylenol on the shelves. It was because of this. Oh, so I didn't know that was what it yeah, is. Even with the tamper resistant, if they had a fine enough needle, you could actually pierce the yeah, because how long? Do, I mean, how many people actually look at that? I know I pop it open if I have a headache, especially. I'm just, you know, I'm not exactly. paying attention to it. So what they actually did was the extra, the migraine extra strength mm -hmm. was pierced because it's a tablet form. So they had a, a fine needle that act actually had, um, it was a laxative, so it wasn't a lethal medication. It was more of a prank that was done, but what they were actually doing was injecting one or two caps, um, tablets. The, the powder tablets with that mm -hmm. so it was making people going to the bathroom and all that stuff and don't they put the, the is that why they put the the cotton in there too because they're gonna no. get somewhere it's like that and then the cotton like wouldn't that pr provide some sort of a blocker too no the cotton is just there to to keep the pills in place from going like <laughs> exactly I from think creating like a block and if you notice the caps the the cotton is actually only in the tablets mm -hmm. form it's not in the in mm -hmm. capsules and mm -hmm. such because what it is is trying to hold it so it doesn't hit against there mm -hmm. and break break apart the tablets oh okay yeah. good to know all right well thank you for joining me yes it's always a pleasure <laughs> If you are interested in movies, I recommend that you check out his channel, Man Bites Media. Or if you are interested in a ASMR that's a little bit of a different experience, check out Cellar Door, A Journey into Middle Earth, which is very, very different. And why don't you tell them, tell them a little bit about that? Uh, so yes, uh, the um, Cellar Door, A Journey into Middle Earth is actually an ASMR experience as well, but it's an audio drama where we actually grab the fantasy element of Lord of the Rings and we actually go into the backstory. We go into the mythology behind the, the Tolkien uh, writings and we grab all 22 books and we put it into chronological order appropriately and we tell the story with sound effects, with music, with um, two... I like to say that we both have become very experienced in doing voice acting when it comes to this and we do do voice acting so it is a little bit more and there are short little audios they're about 10 minutes a piece and they are used to, to help and stimulate um sleep cycle that's what we aim for we don't aim to wake up people it's more relaxed more calming and all that stuff but definitely for that fandom group yeah definitely or for anyone just interested in general in fantasy mm -hmm. honestly in any type of fantasy writing or fantasy storytelling this would be very up your alley, I think. And we're available on any other podcast channels as well. Thank you again. Thank you.